Hello, everyone. This is Mike Strautmanis with the Obama Foundation, and we are here live at the Obama Foundation's inaugural summit. We are here to inspire, empower, and connect the next generation of leaders and active citizens from across the US, right here in the city of Chicago, my hometown, and around the globe, and that includes you. We are so glad that you're tuning in with us. I got a couple of folks who are a part of the summit who have taken some time to join us today. They're gonna to talk a little bit about their experiences. We want you to meet them and get to know them. The first one is Paul Green. He is the founder of the Appalachian Technolo Technology Institute. We got a little video to play, and so watch this, and next person you'll see will be our guy, Paul Green. So my name is Paul Green, and I created the Appalachian Technology Initiative. We were talking about well, what could K-12 education do to become an economic driver in our local communities. And we knew that STEM fields, those are the jobs of the future. We also knew that based on the data that our school systems really weren't creating pipelines and pathways for our students in these fields. So the ATI came about as a way to create opportunity for kids. Depending on what year you look at the metrics, we are always either the first or second course in the United States Congressional District. And we want to make sure that our kids in Eastern Kentucky have opportunities just like every kid in, in the world. We're hearing you know, all types of stories of kids now that are going into fields of computer science or uh, aviation, aerospace related fields because of this initiative that probably two or three years ago would never even thought about that. And, and all we need is just that little spark to, you know, we can do this. And then once you give them that spark, then we have kids all over the place. I mean, they just take off. And we are so pleased to have Paul Green with us right now. Paul, how have you enjoyed your time here in Chicago at our first summit? Oh my gosh, this has been the most amazing experience for me. And um, to be able to meet such great people from around the country and around the world, I um, actually had an opportunity to uh, have uh, dinner last night with the First Lady and wow. got to actually shake hands with President Obama. Wow. And so it's been absolutely amazing. You know, there's so much about what you do that is grounded and rooted in your community. Mm -hmm. um, and now you have the opportunity to be here and, and represent that community with President and Mrs. Obama and all these people from the, around the world. Uh, what does that mean to you? And tell us about the people who you're here to represent. So, you know, I'm from rural southeast Kentucky, the Appalachian Mountains, and, um, you know, was raised there, went to school there, uh, went back and, and worked in the school system as a teacher and a principal and a coach, and, and to be able to um, do some work in STEM education throughout the region and be able to represent um, our people is just amazing, and I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be here. You know, when we hear about the digital economy and, and connecting jobs to all the dynamism that's a part of technology in our lives today, you know, sometimes it can seem so difficult and challenging and big, but you found some practical ways to make a difference. Could you share some of that for us? Well, I mean, a, a real brief story. Um, you know, my son um, was actually uh, in, in the school system that I worked in, and he came to me when he was a freshman in high school, and he said, Dad, you know, I really want to be... Um, uh, I wanted to take a coding class, and, and I was unable as a, as a chief academic officer in the school district to provide him that opportunity. And when I went to my current role at KVEC, Kentucky Valley Education Cooperative, you know, I, I wanted to try to be able to engage kids throughout the region in these, in, in these STEM fields, knowing that, you know, the future of our economy and, and community development is um, uh, STEM-related engineering jobs and that we have to provide our students these opportunities. And in rural America, a lot of our kids aren't exposed to these things. Uh, they don't really know that they exist. Uh, we come from an area that's been based on a mono economy of uh, extraction of resources, whether it be coal or timber. And uh, so we've got to be able to provide these opportunities for our kids. And so the solution was is to get passionate people together, provide them uh, training, support, uh, find digital content, you know, we're in an age of, of, of a digital world where content is available, so let's use that content and let's be able to find ways to break down these barriers in these traditionally poor, remote areas and find ways to engage these kids in, in, in these great opportunities. You know, so much of what the president is doing next is about civic engagement and mm -hmm. creating better citizens. Can you, do you have any no, notions about how having these skills and having these opportunities for the STEM fields where you live, 
how that creates better citizens? Well, we're hoping we're able to create better citizens by allowing our citizens from the region to be able to stay where they are. Uh, I thought it was last night, I actually had a conversation with the first lady and she talked about when she went back to her high school and they said, why, why the South side? Why, why are you coming back to the South side? And, uh, you know, she, you know, that's her roots and she wants to be there. And that's the same thing we want to be able to do in Eastern Kentucky is we want to provide opportunities in Eastern Kentucky for our kids to say, stay, you know, we can create better citizens, but we can't create better citizens that always leave our region and go other places. So what we have to do is we have to train them, give them skills that can potentially lead to economic opportunities in Eastern Kentucky that allow them to stay and allow us to rebuild, you know, our region with our, our youth leading the way. Yeah, I think some people might say that, you know, you're coming here from rural America, you're coming here from Kentucky. There may not be a lot of other folks here who are from there, and there might be so many things that are different from you and the other people who are here in the summit, but what have you found in common? So I think that, that it, it is, it's interesting to hear a lot of the stories from urban areas and to see how those are the similar issues we face in, in rural America. But I also uh, find that, you know, uh, some of the, the solutions that we've been able to come and overcoming barriers in rural America are solutions that can be replicated in other areas, not just in rural America, but in other places. So it's been real exciting. I've enjoyed so many great conversations with so many people, the connections I've been able to make. And, you know, I know that after I leave here um, that there, I, there's going to be a lot of future conversations with a lot of people that I really feel like are going to benefit our region, but also hopefully I can share and help other people and benefit their regions as well. Well, Paul, it's been great having you here at the summit. I hope you have a great time in, the, in, in my hometown of Chicago, uh, and you continue to inspire us. This Thanks so much. Great. Thanks, Mike. So next, we are joined by Delfina Irazuta, who's the founder of the Local Innovation Network. Let's watch her video and learn a little bit about the great work she's doing in communities back in Argentina. My name is Delfine Erasusta and I founded the Local Innovation Networks, an NGO that works to improve management capacities of local governments. I started by myself, now we have 35 people working, of which 30 are women. <laughs> I don't know if you know Argentina, but it's really big. We have 2,200 local governments all through the country. For me it was amazing to discover that many mayors wanted to, to be helped. And for me, it's very inspiring when I see a local government official or a mayor making decisions different uh, because of all the tools and resources we give them and with all the tools and resources they share with each other. We are all a generation that wants to work with each other, so I'm really excited to finding others that also are trying to change the world <laughs> and to meet them in the Obama Summit this October. Delfina's work is so inspiring, and she happens to be with us right now. Hello. Hi. So we saw the video, and we saw all the work that you do, but we didn't really get a chance to see about why you started the organization in the first place. Can you tell us how this got started? That's, that's a nice question, and has to do with my story. I lived in four different cities in my whole life, and cities that had many differences between them. And when I moved to one place from another, I started like asking questions. What makes a more attractive one city? Why I can get a job in one city and then I cannot find it in the other? Or why I have more quality in life in one city and then I have many problems in another just as security, transportation. And I think that it's a question that many people do also like we want to have like great quality of life and also opportunities. And then I realized that one of the organization that was involved, the, or the main organization that was involved in the answers, were the local governments. So that's when I started thinking, let's help local governments. So let's uh, help them transforming cities. You know, I had a chance to work with somebody who worked in local government here at the city of Chicago. We worked together at the White House. It was interesting to see her name is Valerie Jarrett, and it was interesting to see all the lessons that she learned in local government and how she brought that um, to the federal government. Have you found anybody else here that's working in local government in other communities around the world? 
Yes, there are many people involved with local governments and also one of the subjects we are uh, talking much is about civic en engagement and we are learning much from the US. US. Uh, cities here in the US has like two main things that we don't have in our country and that we are trying to implement. One is the figure of the city manager that is really important. The position, the city yeah. manager position. And the other one is the boards and commissions because there are like two figures that city managers permits the coordination of all the areas, all the departments. And when coordination happens, then innovation happens. And then when innovation happens in a city, the city works better. And if the city works better, so people live better. So we are, that's our aim. And boards are commissioned really nice because they are like the tool to, to engage other citizens and the private-public alliances. You know, you used a word just now um, that is a buzzword you hear all the time, and that's innovation. Um, but you know, in, I've, innovation, you're focused so much on impact, and even your story is about your own life. Can you give us some examples on how you've seen innovation really benefit people's lives? <laughs> yes. I've seen many times that local governments try to solve problems, so they design policies to solve those problems and they implement the policies, and at the end the problem is still there. And innovation is a way to make problems being solved. And you have to try to think different, and you have to try to understand better the problems, and when you understand that, then you're going to design better solutions. You know, you're here with people from all across the U.S. and, and, and all around the world. Um, and you're so focused on what's local. Uh, another word you hear a lot about is scale. You know, people want to scale solutions. People want to scale things. Talk to us a little bit about your perspective on scaling and creating global solutions, uh, learning lessons from how to do things locally. That's a very special word for us because we started with one city and now we have 90. <laughs> wow, and that's we are scaling. expecting next year to have 300 cities. Oh my goodness, wow. <laughs> so we built a model prepared to scale. And I think that we, we, are, we are going to work regionally probably. So I think that's a word we, we understand and we use. Well, I really appreciate you joining us on this live stream. And I really hope you uh, enjoy and get so much out of the rest of the summit. And I hope you come back to Chicago. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next guest is Emily May. Emily May is the co-founder of the People's Summer, Supper and the co-founder of Holla Back. Let's watch a video and learn a little bit more about her work. My name is Emily May. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Hollaback, a movement to end all forms of harassment that started right here in Brooklyn and now is in over 50 cities, in over 30 countries, in over 15 languages around the world. Harassment is such an isolating experience and we wanted to show people that there were other people out there who were going through what they were going through and that we had their back. As part of our work, we have just launched a collaboration called The People's Supper, designed to get people to sit down with one another across political views, across identities, and to fully see and hear one another, to hear each other's stories, to believe and, and to see each other's humanity. Through community, through our ability to take care of one another, I think that we can make people feel whole. Emily is doing inspiring work, and we're just thrilled to have you with us today. So, Emily. Yes. I, when I introduced you, I uh, saw that the name of your organization, Holla Back, has an exclamation point. So I got all excited and went, Holla Back. Holla Back. Is that what we do? Is that, is that we, why is there an exclamation point there? Talk to us about that. We take it seriously. Okay. We have a lot of we have a lot of oomph to our Holla Back. We're not just quietly like, oh, Holla Back, you know. <laughs> Holla Back. We're like serious We're about it. this. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta have a response to harassment that matters to you. Yeah, and, and I think that we hear a lot about empowerment mm. and what empowerment means. And so I would love for the work that you do to explain to us, what, what does empowerment mean to you? 
You know, empowerment is one of those words that I feel like so often we use it to describe like, oh, I'm going to go out and empower somebody. Like it's almost like something that you do to somebody else. Um, and when I think about, you know, real authentic empowerment, it's something not that somebody does to you, right? Or that somebody gives you a list of how to do, right? It's something that really comes up from inside you and, and, and really is specific to you, to specific to your history, specific to your identities, and truly authentic. So when it merges up out of you as, you know, that, that hollow back, as that response, um, it could be a quiet poem that you write, or it could be um, a very loud statement that this isn't okay. You know, we've talked a lot at this summit about civic engagement um, and being a citizen and having a voice. And then earlier today, Mrs. Obama said that Sometimes there are barriers to having a voice. You need to really know that your voice counts and your voice matters. Tell us about what you've seen and how your work has helped people have that voice and how you think it's made them better citizens. Yeah, I th I, that was so touching. I actually cried when she said that because she talked about, you know, how, um, how when we're so little, you know, that we don't have a voice, that we don't know how to say, don't touch me there or don't say that to me. Um, and so often when people come to us experiencing, you know, harassment, um, they just need the simple reminder that it's okay to say, don't touch me there, don't say that to me. Um, and that that is enough and that that is okay and that setting that boundary is something that they're allowed to do. Um, I think that, um, that again, a voice isn't something that you can give somebody, uh, but it's something that you can deeply listen to and hear and create space for. Um, and as folks do that work to find their voice and they, and they do that work to kind of trample over, like what are, what are the words that are going to be my voice? Is it going to be that harassment isn't okay? Or is it going to be something else, you know, um, that you're there for them? And that all of those, those stumblings as they, as, they, as they find those words and they find that meaning that is authentic and resonant to them, um, I think being there for people and making space for that is what it's all about. You know, we have some incredible leaders with us here at this summit, and most of them are here because they're doing like one big thing. You're doing at least two, so I want to switch <laughs> gears, and I want to talk about this other big thing that you're doing, because we had really, I had a lovely experience yesterday. Yeah. We went to the south side of Chicago, and we had a supper, yeah. and all of us came, and we sat, and we ate together. Um, one of the questions that we talked about in there is, when did you feel like you belonged in your community? And so yeah. uh, I'm going to ask you that question. Well, first, I'm going to ask you how you came up with that question, yeah. why it's meaningful for you. And then I want you to tell us, when did you feel like you first belonged in your community? Oh, gosh. Um, yeah. You know, that, that dinner that we had last night, that supper, because we don't just have dinner at the Obama summit, we have supper. That's right. Um, uh, you know, was, was uh, so incredible and such an incredible opportunity for us as the People's Supper to collaborate with brilliant and beautiful folks like Eric Liu, for example. Um, and we were on conference calls with Eric Liu, and I'm like geeking out. I'm like, oh my God, that's Eric's doorbell that I hear in the background. <laughs> you know, um, and, and, and that question of like, how do you how do you know your people? Who are your people? Who is your, your community? And, um, and I think that, um, that for me, that my, my community, my people, um, are the people um, who are able um, to see what's wrong, but they're able to also see what's possible in that. They're able to imagine a science fiction world that, that we just, um, haven't lived yet. Um, I was just in the fiction workshop, so I'm, I'm revved up That's about right the use of right. fiction. Let's go. I'm go. revved up. Go I'm with it. Up. Go with um, it. But you know, uh, imagine that world that that we haven't lived yet, right? So it's a, it's one thing for me to say I want to end harassment. It's another thing to say to envision a world where people are able to truly hear and listen and learn from each other and to soak each other's stories in deeply. Um, and to see each other as being fully, fully, fully human. Mm. Um, that is a whole other world. That's a world that we don't live in. That's a thing that doesn't happen. That's a, a thing that, that selfies and, and tweets aren't built to do. That's right. But that is a thing that dinner tables mm. have been doing for a long time in different ways if we just ask each other the right questions. Well, Emily, uh, I'm really thrilled that I had a chance to have this conversation with you. Your energy is infectious yeah. and your work is inspiring. So I really Thank hope you, you enjoy the rest of your summit. And thanks for spending time with us in our hometown of Chicago. Thank you so much. Thank you. So next, Sheldon Smith, the founder of the Dovetail Project, is going to share a little bit about his story with us. Let's check out his video and learn a little bit more about Sheldon's work.
My name is Sheldon Smith, and I am the founder of The Dovetail Project that works with young African-American fathers between the ages of 17 to 24 here in Chicago. Oftentimes, you don't hear about the good things that are occurring on the South Side, so my inspiration really comes from being overlooked. The impact that, you know, that I'm looking for us to have is, is really fulfilling the missing gaps that, you know, that the fathers are struggling with. Overall, just giving them the space that they need to be successful fathers. When I run into alumni and I see them with their children, it's, it's an awesome feeling and it, and it gives me that extra passion that I need because oftentimes as leaders, it's tough to get that fuel that you need to keep you out here in the fight. It's really about, you know, building one family at a time. Watching the young men go through the program and watching us make impact on their lives, it, it all always let me know and confirm that the work that we're doing is, is the right work. I've gotten to know Sheldon and this brother is inspiring. I think it's very exciting that we have him with us here today. Sheldon. Hey, hey. Mr. How you doing, man? Hey, I'm fine, Mr. Strott. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You can call me Strott, okay? Uh, all right. <laughs> okay, my man. <laughs> so this fatherhood work that you do, um, Obviously, part of your story, well, not obviously, it's from what I've learned, started when you learned that you were going to become a father. Tell us about that moment. Yeah, well, when I was 21, I uh, found out that I was going to become a young dad. And, uh, you know, I, I had up and down and mixed feelings about it. And, you know, it wasn't until my daughter was born that I really settled into it. And so seeing her being born and cutting her umbilical cord and just being there, you know, to, to just watch something great happened was uh, was awesome. It was a special moment. Yes, it was. You know, my uh, father left our family before I was born. Mm. Um, so I know what it's like to grow up, at least for some period of time, without a father. Um, and I'm so appreciative of the work that you're doing. How have you seen your work not only change the lives of the fathers that you're working with, but their children and their communities? Well, so for us, you know, and, and being able to see these gentlemen go through the program and get jobs and get GEDs and, and get involved in the trades and, you know, and to see them years later doing what they really ultimately really want to do. And that's just being responsible. And so for us, being able to look back on that time and looking at our young men now and looking at the effect on them uh, with their families at different events for us is it's just it's so exciting. Well, you're from Chicago, and your work south is side. right on the south side. That's right. <laughs> uh, but we're here today with so many people from around the country and around the world. What have you learned from the people you've been with over the last day and a half? Well, I've, I've learned so much. Uh, I've learned about work in Cuba that people are doing. I've seen entrepreneurs who've come here from Africa who've talked about scale and replication uh, in building great businesses and infrastructure. I've just been able to talk to different leaders about the work that they've been doing across the country. We're working with immigrants and just being able to give back, right? And, and so as a leader, being able to have that conversation is always good because sometimes, you know, that world is lonely. So right. I learned a lot. And you've learned a lot, but I'm sure you've given some too. So I'm gonna ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about what you've been able to pass on to others. I Talking about the narrative of fatherhood and why dads matter and the importance of uplifting that narrative uh, with helping dads get the resources that they need and engaging around replication and scalability, right? Really talking about the work and figuring out how do you make a, a, a greater impact in what it is that you're doing and how do you get it across the country so that you're helping other people too as well. And so it's it's been a, a very exciting conversation. You know. So much of the work that leaders like you do, you get up every day and, yeah, you have a cause that you're excited about, but, you know, everything is going wrong every single day. You come into the office and something is happening, something is falling apart. But yet you still keep going. That's right. What inspires you? What keeps you going? It's the, it's the children, right? So I do this work because I want to impact kids at the end of the day. And so when we get a chance to see our fathers go on to do great things and see them with their kids, right? For us, it's another child that's been impacted. It, and in order to impact that child, it's through fatherhood. And so when, you know, when I first started, it was because of my daughter or because of my father being in and out of my life. And so now it's about the mission, the work, the people who we serve. 
You know, earlier today, we started off the first session uh, with a little bit of quiet time, uh -huh. with some meditation. Yes. Uh, and that can be just a form of taking care of yourself. And then Mrs. Obama, during her session, she, she hit home. really told leaders like you to take care of yourself. Yes. So what, how does that mean to you? What do, what do you do to take care of yourself well, as you I, do this work? I'm happy you said that. And so when I was sitting there listening to uh, Mrs. Obama and and... For me, it's being able to schedule that time for me first, right? And so it it made sense in the way that she laid it out. And so oftentimes in doing this work, you're so worried about the people who you're serving. You're so worried about, you know, the agency and what's going on internally that you're not reflecting back on yourself. And so for me, I am definitely taking that, that golden egg to utilize that and, and really make the time to put me first within the schedule. And so I just thought it was awesome coming from the First Lady. You know, today is about this network and these leaders, but the Obama Foundation is also creating a place. That's right. We're creating the Obama Presidential Center on the south side of Chicago. I got less than a minute left, but I want you to tell us quickly, what does that Obama Presidential Center mean to you? It, I mean, it means so much. Growing up in Woodlawn, uh, going up to Jackson Park and playing ball, but right, but watching the economic development, being able to go there to the library, but not only that, just having a place where world leaders would be coming to every year. When you're looking at over 700,000 people coming to the south side of Chicago, mm -hmm. that's really unheard of. And so to have that moment here in Chicago, I think is, I just think it's amazing and I'm excited about it. Well, Sheldon, thank you for the tremendous work that you're doing. Uh, I'm inspired. I am fired up by these people. I hope that you are, too. Uh, next, we're going to have Amy Woodall. Amy is the founder and CEO of the Black Sheep Agency. She's also a Houston Astros fan, so we're going to talk to her about Game 7 uh, and spend some time keeping it real. Let's watch Amy's video and learn a little bit more about her work. Harvey is coming. Saturday the storm hits. Monday I'm trapped. Tuesday I'm trapped. Wednesday I'm trapped. So Friday morning I go volunteer with a friend and we get the idea that there's more that we can be doing. We find a space, open our doors the next morning to something that we called the Giving Hub. My name is Amy Woodall and I'm from Houston, Texas. I'm the founder of the Black Sheep Agency. So we go from two female entrepreneurs running creative businesses to distribution hub managers. People showed up, more than 400 volunteers moved during that 21 days, over 100,000 goods. What I witnessed during the storm was something that I wish we could see in each other all the time just jump in to solve problems together without a storm as the catalyst. Imagine what we could accomplish together. Amy continues to inspire us and we have a chance to chat with her here today. Hello, Amy, welcome to Chicago. Hi, thank you so much. It's incredible to be here. You know, the first thing I wanna just share is, you know, I'm a fan of the current World Series champion, Chicago Cubs. <laughs> <laughs> but it looks like we're going to be dethroned. Yes. You're rooting for? The Astros, okay. naturally. Uh, you know, we were tied up last night at a, a very special event in Chicago, and I yes. missed the game. And uh, apparently we, we have a challenge ahead of us tonight, but I have no doubt that the Astros will rise to the occasion. Well, let's talk about last night. We had an opportunity to have supper together, you and a few hundred of your closest friends, uh, but we did it in a way that created these tables. Tell us a little bit about your table. Who'd you have supper with last night? I was at table 20 and I had supper with people from around the world. A woman from Haiti to my left, a woman living in New York uh, who is originally from India to my right, across the table, um, someone from Uganda, uh, just such diversity around the table, such diversity of interest, such diversity of background, and such diversity of passion, which led us to all sorts of interesting dinner conversation, as you might imagine. Yes. Uh, unlike any dinner I've ever had before, and probably a nod to the way dinners should be, um, which I think was part of the message of the evening. I think so, too. I'm gonna, I learned some lessons that I'm going to take with me, uh, even to my dinner with my family at home. I loved it. It was like, lean in. Not, don't be about yourself. Be about the person across the table from you. Start with your heart. Like throw it all in, and um, don't read the resume off before right. you uh, before you start the conversation. So it was it was just a really good place to be. 
But we saw in that video the incredible work that you did in the aftermath of the hurricane and, and everything that took place in your hometown. But prior to that, you had started, a, you were an entrepreneur uh, and you're the founder and CEO of an agency. Tell us a little bit about that work and, and how you got started. Sure. So I run the Black Sheep Agency in Houston, Texas, and it is an impact focused brand strategy firm. What does that mean? It means we work with people who are trying to make the world a better place. Uh, a lot of those people are work for nonprofits. They're driving causes forward. Some of those people are with government or civic organizations. Some of those people are working for profit, but really trying to bring purpose into their work and really create change and fight for social good. Um, so I get to wake up and fight beside them every day, applying creative power, strategic power to accelerate their mission and activate people around things that really matter across the nation across the world and most importantly to me right in my own Houston community um, so I started with that work and then uh, the hurricane was a catalyst for applying what I know how to do which is um, manage big projects uh, listen to the need and then um, think creatively to activate people to do the things that need to be done and that's kind of what we did in the in the hurricane you know, crisis like that, that hurricane, um, some people say it builds character. Yeah. But, you know, I've heard others say that it reveals character. What did that experience reveal to you about your neighbors and the community that you call home? I mean, it kind of leaves me speechless. So let me tr try to quickly, right, don't be quickly find the words <laughs> um, for what I saw Houston do during that moment and, and what most importantly, very important to say this, everyone here keeps asking me, how is Houston doing? And, you know, we all jumped in and responded right away, but we got a long road ahead of us. So um, I think you're right. It does reveal character. Perhaps it, it teaches us lessons and builds character along the way. But right away, I saw Houston drop every, everything, every, you know, bit of armor that they had or every you know, preconceived notion that they might have had, you know, maybe the space between them and their neighbors, and all of a sudden we were in it together and we were fighting and we were loving each other and just welcome each other and responding to each other's needs in a way, you know, strangers were immediately, um, you know, the person that you were meant to serve. And um, I, I said it in, in the interview and in the video is that, is the kind of thing that we need to see all the time. Yes. And and we do see it, but we don't see it the way we see it in disaster. It's just like everything goes and that crisis just brings us together in such a powerful way. And if we could bottle that and, and sprinkle it all over the nation <laughs> um, and just stop seeing our differences and start seeing the humanity and the need and the heart of, you know, the eyes mm -hmm. of the people across from us, it would just we would be able to do so much and we would be so far ahead of where we are um, today. Well, I so appreciate your work um, and I so appreciate you spending this conversation with us and our live audience. Thank you. Connecting with us. And thank you. Thank you so much. That you're doing. Um, Enjoy the rest of your summit. Go Astros. Go, go Astros. Yeah. All right. I'm with you. Well, listen, please continue to visit Obama.org for ways that you can stay involved in our work at the Obama Foundation our work to inspire, empower, and connect the next generation of leaders and active citizens around the world. And stay tuned right here for more live footage from Chicago at our inaugural Obama Foundation Summit.